I don't know whether anyone knows Hong Kong, but I was actually working in Taiwan for um, oh. <laughs> Where's that coming from? It's quite hard to concentrate with that music going on in the background. Um, I was on the uh, Star Ferry, which is uh, this little boat that goes backwards and forwards between Hong Kong side and uh, Kowloon side. And I bumped into this guy and uh, he recognized me from a magazine in Taiwan and said, oh, you're Michael, aren't you? Uh, I'm a watchmaker and I'll make, uh, make you a watch. So just design one and uh, send me the drawings. And I kind of thought to myself, um, this is really dodgy. Uh, I'm in China, I'm giving someone a watch design. Why well, is this like a free design service? And I'll just say adios, goodbye. But anyway, um, at the time I actually had an office in Brussels. So I came back to Brussels and three weeks later, these watches, um, appeared in the, through the door. They were a little bit not quite as uh, sort of as uh, the quality wasn't quite there, but they were incredible. And uh, what it made me think was that in three weeks I'd made a watch. And anyway, I started wearing this watch uh, around the place and uh, they started to sell quite organically. And before I knew it, I was selling thousands of these watches. And I'm not really a businessman, they, it was just something that was happening. And I remember. Um, I brought a whole load of stuff back to Super Studio and made this little stand. But the idea was I had all of the boxes there um, because I was going to give them to various shops around Europe um, afterwards. But what happened is a queue started to develop all the way outside the door and everyone was buying these watches. I think I was selling them for like 70 euros. So I was leaving Super Studio with bags full of cash, walking back to the hotel in Manzoni, putting it in the locker like that, you know. Um, and uh, it was just an insane situation. And it suddenly made me realize uh, how immediate something could be. It was totally accidental. I did the same in Japan, in Tokyo, during 100% Design Week, and the same happened again. Um, and through that, what I actually developed was something quite unique to the studio, which was uh, this massive sales network around the world of retail design stores and uh, also hundreds of journalists. So it really made me think, okay, this place, China, Hong Kong, is uh, I can do something really unique. Um, at the same time, I was out there in China, I was working uh, for a, a brand called uh, Kiki de Montparnasse in Green Street in New York. Um, and they asked me to design a sex toy. Um, so I immediately, uh, I, had a, I had a girl working for me out there just part time at that, at, at that moment. And uh, we located a sex toy factory, made the 3D files, and it suddenly again made me realize that I could make, I made, we designed this in a week, uh, we made the tooling, uh, we made a really high quality finish on the tools so we could charge more money for it. And um, after that, it made me realize I could, I could start to design more like putty. I could really design shapes that I wasn't really familiar with uh, in, in Europe very easily. As it happened, the uh, company that I made this for, uh, they, they, the, the creative director stopped working and uh, I got left with around 10,000 sex toys in my studio and in the factory. So I actually started to distribute them myself and that was really entertaining. So I was making all of these Michael Young sex toys and sending them to all of these bizarre places. And it's incredible the amount of appeal these sort of objects have. And they sold out. Um, but I decided uh, never to get involved in retail because it's actually hard work. So in contrast to that, at the same time, Established and Sons were starting in, in England. And I just wanted to sh show you this because what you're forced to do, I find in England, is design things that are s s easy to manufacture. So in, in one sense, the, uh, the, you know, you're, you're forced to look for things that perhaps are more poetic or deeper in meaning. So, you know, so when you... Um, look at things like uh, Droog design, you know, you have a wine glass that turns into a doorbell or things that are really low tech. So in Europe, I was forced to design things that all had um, straight edges. Um, hey, is it okay if wherever that noise is coming from? Um, um, excuse me. Um, so that really, you see the contrast in the types of design I was doing. Um, it really, really influenced me to go 
and spend more time there. So the first times I started working, you know, my, uh, my interest in design comes from the lack of ability to do anything else. You know, I can't really do my accounts. I can't do any of these things that involve, uh, you know, I only sometimes use spell check because I just assume people will get the idea of what my email is talking about. Um, and it's, it's not lazy, it's, it's just, I guess I'm a more visual person uh, in many ways and that's how I work. And you know, when I was going around China and seeing things like this, you know, that's complete chaos within an order and that's the sort of uh, the, the, the framework that I like for my work. I started playing with all of these matrices of uh, possibilities of building shapes as soon as I went out there and uh, started making things like this. This was just uh, a test. It was for Philips uh, de Paris. It was an auction for, to raise money for charity for birds and, and bees whose habitats were being destroyed. And it actually started to get me off in making these collections of things which were sort of uh, inspired by handcrafting uh, that I saw around Asia. So not only did I have what I believed in, which was, uh, you know, I, I started my career by making things, welding and what have you. And I could go from high technology to craft really, really easily over there and do all of these things which are very, very economical. And started playing around actually, at the time I was doing those, uh, the US dollar was crashing and this became worthless. So I started making um, the furniture out of the cash and selling that to various collectors around the world, which is quite funny because when you think you're actually sending boxes of cash around the planet, it's a really conceptually quite a, a unique way to do it. And uh, But uh, perhaps uh, the Italians vary. It's, it's a little bit tricky when you get these things into customs though. Um, there's another version for established. And clocks like this. So I'm still, you know, this is my, you should say my hobby. Um, I love just to play in these workshops and find different ways of building, making objects. Um, I'm actually coming to a point of describing all of these different factors. I was actually in Bali by a swimming pool and I met another guy who, uh, in the design business, you know, everyone kind of knows each other, we're not hard to recognize. Um, and he asked me to design a piece of furniture for him, which became this. And what I learned was that I had to start designing things that were difficult to copy. Because if you start making furniture in, in Bali, Thailand, Vietnam, northern China, um, things can be copied really easily, not because uh, of any sort of aggressive behavior, just because people un don't understand that something that is created to be unique uh, has a sort of uh, intellectual uh, property to it. So I started designing things like this, where the top joint, you need a five axis CNC, C CNC machine to make it. And uh, so that was really starting to inform my approach of how I was uh, working for companies in Asia. Um, and even making carbon fiber ones, but I'll come back to that. I've always, at the same time, when I've been out in Asia, I've always flown back to Europe because I feed, what I lack is the culture. Uh, I need the, the richness of history. So I still uh, come back, I do several projects a year based uh, on, on uh, I should, should we say, more hi historical uh, values things like furniture for Swedese, which have a, a stand over there. Furniture like this is, you know, one of the reasons I is a little bit sad to leave in, in England is that companies will not invest in, in things. So to actually keep the culture of a country or design, you actually need to invest in products because that gives them longevity and respect. So I notice when I walk around a lot of furniture that is uh, pretty much all the same. It's made with a piece of wood and a, 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 you know, a piece of foam on top and it's upholstered. And the limitations within what you can do, I find quite restrictive. So when a, when a company in Sweden invests in a, in a product like this, you know that they're serious about it. And for me, that's really important working for a company. So in 20 years time, we'll still be making this. We'll still be specifying it in airports, but a lot of furniture that's not invested in vanishes very quickly. Um, so, the biggest life change really, um, I came from a workshop environment. When I was out there, giant bicycles asked me to uh, start to design bikes for them, to make a shift from the, the sports industry to what they call the fashion industry. They don't consider design uh, design. They think it's a, this sort of weird sort of fashion thing because it's not really, if it, if it looks good, it must be fashion. It's not industrial. Um, the idea of this bike 
Um, oh, that's a bit louder, isn't it? It's really strange hearing your voice that loud. Um, the idea of this bike was to make something really utilitarian. By that, I mean, every, when, bike des when designers design bikes, they tend to do this crazy stuff, which never works. So I decided, uh, when the CEO said to me, we need something serious, Michael, because I'm putting my name behind this, I decided to do something really utilitarian. So we took a, a standard town bike and just added more details, made, made, the re made it more refined. And the idea of this was to educate the staff within Giant how to work with a designer. What it taught me was, for the first time, that design is not about me. It's actually about all of the people who work in that production line, all of the people packing boxes, the people putting the transfers on. All of these guys have to earn a living. You see old ladies sort of, you know, wrapping things in polythene, and you understand that it's pretty serious that you're responsible for them earning money uh, at the end of each week. And it really began to take the ego out of all of the things I th thought design were about and uh, you know design slowly but surely has become uh, less and less about me <laughs> to see my very good friend from uh, from 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 Hong Kong standing over there um, so what I said to giant you see giant companies like that don't know what design really does so I said to the marketing department I'll, I'll show you how to get two million euros worth of PR um, without paying for it. You just, uh, we take the bike, we rented a suite in Hotel Klaska in Tokyo. I got the PR director of Lacoste, who's a friend of mine, to invite 20 magazines for two days. I did interviews all day, um, filled the room with champagne, had a party in there, and the result was that we did a whole new sort of coverage of media across, across Japan to all of these. Uh, so anyway, um, the slide before that, I was just going to show you uh, loads of press that we got. So finally, uh, they gave me the permission to design this bike, uh, which is a bike that I wanted to design because it was a little bit more, shall we say, masculine. And I got to play around in the factory and do all of these things that I could never do when I was working in European factories, like making all of these huge hydro forms, putting LED lights in crossbars, um, making details like this. Can you watch? Are you going to do the manual one? OK. OK, yeah, sorry, I'm just in a daze. Um, sorry. So anyway, what actually happened, um, working in those bike factories, working on the, with the, these new sort of um, uh, making all of these sex toys and these watches actually began to inform a really new way of working for me. Because when I left college, actually, computers were just invented. And, uh, um, you know, you, the, the, the only computer program I think designers used then was AutoCAD. And my complete lack of education rendered that an impossibility. So I was still struggling. You know, then everything had a sort of straight edge and a, a, a circle, a, 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 a round corner, because the only equipment I had was a, a, a ruler and a circle template. And um, now I'd learned to use, you know, what I do like about all of these computer kids is that. Uh, I don't, you know, I don't use the computer, but you can use these little uh, computer graduates like a welding torch now, you know, they're just like and they, they, you know, they can transfer this information for you. So for me, they're the new welding torches. Um, anyway, um, through being informed by these processes brought me to learning how to apply industry from things I learned in the bicycle industry to things like this. Now, this was a really rare occasion for me because I was giving a talk at Business of Design Week um, and a guy came up to me at the end of my lecture, Marcus, who I don't know whether he's here, he was going to come, and he said to me, we'll do absolutely anything you want, uh, free of charge, we just want to make something for you. And I again thought, oh my God, here's one of these freaky moments where someone's offering to do something free for me and uh, what's in it, you know, is it going to get a spoon in my head in six months' time and start freaking me out? Um, so I decided to make something completely insane and make this, which made no sense to anyone whatsoever. But I was still informed by these little bits of paper I'd been trying to build structures out of. And slowly but surely, making these, which had no function, they were just experiments. Um, eventually, 
what I decided to do was get all of the work I'd done and try and package it just to see in Europe what the response was like to the things I was doing in Asia because I sort of vanished off the radar um, and the thing is I don't, I don't really care about vanishing off the radar I'm not doing design for my ego I just do it for a day-by-day -day, uh, shall we say entertainment so I brought this to Europe to uh, design week in Austria because Austria for me is a really a country that still has a, a, a genuine sort of heritage in, in the arts um, and I started seeing what uh, if I could bring any of this to a commercial level um, and you'll see various objects there um, um, even you know things like this have resulted from that I made this in three weeks in China in one of the factories it was for Trasadi a couple of years ago unfortunately I well not fortunately I just had a baby um, in uh, and then I had to fly the day the, the, the day was baby was born I had to fly from Australia where I was living for the birth uh, and build this but that just begins to show you it, we made 30,000 parts in three weeks in uh, in China send it the difference between the the, the, the furniture industry and the fashion industry is that we, we DHL that uh, uh, to, to Italy from China and you know that you put a few zeros on the budgets for everything you do in fashion and I wish I could work more in fashion but anyway um, keep on going this brings me to objects like this so again in order for me to do things that are uh, shall we say unique or fresh for the market I have to be in that environment to explore all the possibilities. And again, this comes straight from the, from the uh, bicycle industry. Trying to bend these things takes a lot of investment, learning the tolerances and making machines to actually work out how to stop the metal breaking. Um, so the more and more I hung out there with these guys who came and said, we'll do anything you want, I started all my clients I had. I, I, I work for a lot of third generation um, Chinese families because of course the, the grandfathers build the factory and make all of the money supply Apple or Panasonic they make screw tips for aerials all this sort of rock and roll electronics um, and then the you know the, the father the, the sons take it over and send their younger sons really off to Chicago and now all of these young kids are coming back who don't want to make screw tips for aerials they want to do something cool so I've been helping a lot of young guys who are um, coming from backgrounds with you know billions of factories and resources to make whatever they want and creating all of these bizarre sort of objects which I can only do in Hong Kong if you go to the the, the next one um, Things like this, which, you know, this is, I've gone completely against the grain of what's going on in headphones. I made the most biggest opulent uh, headphones I could think of because I'm not into these little plastic things that, you know, this, these, these are going to be around in 20 years' time on your leather chair headphones. Um, but you'll notice that because I've had all of these facilities around me, I've started using a lot of aluminium and gold and surface and studying textures in the work. Um, again, um, this particular product was designed in the pub. It was, um, there was a friend of mine called John Brunner. He's actually here at Design Junction and he lives in Hong Kong. And we were sitting in Hollywood Road and he'd been manufacturing barbecues and going to trade fairs for the last five years. And we had this conversation where he said, Michael, I just can't do this barbecue thing every year. You've got to get me out of it. And we started uh, thinking about what could we do uh, to make a product like this. And this really came out of a two hour conversation. Can you go to the next one? When we realized there was nothing on the market that had a rechargeable battery, um, it was uh, Bluetooth, um, so you could play your music on it. Um, you could charge your telephone up while you were listening to it. Um, if somebody called you, the sound would cut out and you would just speak into it. So it was also a conference telephone. And if it was a personal call, you could just pick it up and go like that and, and have a one-to-one -one situation. Now, when we thought we'd do this, we got on the ferry from Hong Kong side to Kowloon. We went to see a technology company, knocked on their door and said, can you do this? Came back and within three months we had a product. So the fluidity and the process we were, we were, and the energy we can actually get is utterly dynamic. Unfortunately, um, for this product, uh, Eve's designed Jambox and it just went <laughs> um, So anyway, you know, that's life. You've got to stay on, on, on the front of things. Um, Again, 
I hate the watch industry. I really, I really dislike what's happened to watch design over the last 20 years. I mean, it's a sort of mixture between sort of Wrangler jeans and Baroque all rolled into one, and you get these bizarre watches with sort of weird shapes on. So my, my idea is really simplification. Um, we did all of the products I've been designing. A lot of the factory owners I know, this is a friend of mine called Paul So. He said in four years' time, there's going to be a huge recession in England or in Europe, and we have to start making cheaper products. So we started uh, two years ago, actually, uh, manufacturing these watches that look like they're worth 300 US dollars, but actually you can buy them for 130 US dollars. And the idea is all we're really doing, we're putting high quality movements in, uh, using high technology surfaces to make things appear uh, very high quality. And it actually means that for me that's a much more utilitarian approach to offering people design and doing, the, I, I want more people to have mine, which is why I try to keep my prices as low as possible. If we go to the, the next one, we did this in a range of colors, and this is again, helped this Asian company start to spread their network throughout uh, Europe and uh, the United States. Could we? Um, let's go to the next one, I won't talk about that. So I, one of the reasons I'm actually here is because after learning, after building this relationship up um, with my friends, with the factories in, uh, in China, um, we developed this chair and I set up this brand called EOQ which is actually at Design Junction along there. I'm not sure I'm supposed to advertise that at 100% design, but um, that's where it is. Um, so what happened, if we go to the next slide, is um, all of these companies out there are manufacturing for the electronics industry. And I was always poking around their factories, lifting lids up, looking in things you know, that you shouldn't really be looking in. And you always know who's making stuff for Apple when you're wandering around these factories. You're not supposed to know that, but you know, there's always signs. So this, this was one factory that was actually manufacturing casing for Apple. And they'd invested all in the equipment um, but in fact, the prices were getting so pushed down that they decided to stop working for them. So they had this amazing factory set up, half Chinese, half, half Japanese, and they said, just go into our factories and start to use the equipment to make furniture. So what I started to do was, um, I was developing furniture out of equipment that was uh, manufacturing very high-end, um, uh, intricate equipment. So if we go to the next slide, what actually happened was this chair. Um, my wife was designing a, a restaurant at the time in Hong Kong, and uh, she asked me to design a chair. So I actually, for the first time, really, really did some work and thought, you know, I can't screw this up. Um, so I actually worked for several hours in one go. I'm not really capable of working for more than five minutes in a go. I think it's sort of like, you know, sort of midlife ADD or something. Um, so anyway, I focused on this and really tried to design something that incorporated the technology it was impossible to copy and came up with this chair and quite organically and quite naturally in the same way that the watches had gone out and sold themselves this furniture started to people started to call up and say where can we get it but I didn't have a structure in place so I started talking to the factory owners and they decided they want to set a company up to do this so this is really what I would call the kind of new industrial industrial revolution and I was with um, Ilse Crawford when she came there and that's really I, I really love her work which is this sort of sort of post-industrial raw materials and this is as close as I can get to that because people think I'm a sort of over designer um, but you know I'd rather do that than under design um, I love the equipment so we go to the next one um, and we we developed it into a range and then the next one um, and then we started to build it up into a collection. So the spirit of this company is really what I believe design should be, which was after the Second World War, when all of the equipment was uh, laying empty in Italian factories, the, the companies developed products to use the machines and create economy. And this is really the raw cogs of industry, the real cogs of industry moving forward, whereby it's not marketing moving forward, it's economy working from the very raw roots. And for me, this is what 
design is about. I tend to shy away from the marketing aspect of design. I guess it's what we call a necessary evil in my books. Um, so could we go to the next one? So basically, I've launched this light for the first time. This is the first time a light's ever been made by light, but like this in the history. Um, this is a one-piece extrusion. We see and see the shape. We take the center out, and then we make the shape on the exterior. Um, so we can make one tool, and we can make any shape in the world we want. So we can make big lights, little lights. So you can, if you go to Design Junction uh, this afternoon, um, you, can, uh, um, you can have a look at that on a stand called EOQ. And uh, So can we go to the next one? So you'll see it's all very precision. And it's just a shame because I often feel in Europe people are not investing in these sort of ideas. So for design, I think you keep hitting a brick wall. Although, of course, there's masses of masses of talent, uh, I don't see this great investment in, in industry. Um, so we go to the next one, and then the next one. Okay, I just wanted to say a few words about my sort of angle on ecology. Uh, I'm generally um, aware of it and conscious, but it's actually very difficult to get factories. But this is just uh, what, I, what we call, in Japan they say, um, that for a product to be a real product, it has to have a, a you know, a real product has a soul. And to have, to, to have a soul, uh, it has to exist in a, in a real way. And um, when um, Amico, the American company, asked me to do a project, we had to come up with a, a philosophy that was, I would call, you know, it was a 360 degrees holistic project. So we looked at one thing, which is recycling Coca-Cola cans. Um, of which, of course, the United States is producing a lot. But the ironic thing about this project is that this was a little beetle that went in a container full of wood products to, uh, to the United States and it killed all the ash trees. So basically, America has uh, this huge stock of uh, defunct ash, which is beautiful wood to work with, but it just can't be used. So what we did was bring those two things together and then uh, we designed this chair. Um, so. Again, what you can see here is to make these sort of structures in aluminium, which are completely smooth, die cast without any holes in, is very, very difficult. It's a very, uh, shall we say, an Amico chair, but for me, that's what's important is to design for the spirit of the company, not for the spirit of myself. Um, and the older I get, the more I feel stronger, strongly about that. Um, and again, I think the world in terms of uh, um, industry is really starting to respond to that. So when we designed the next product, um, this was a, a product made out of cornstarch. And this was the world's first ever cornstarch earbud. And again, um, this was a company I helped a friend set up called EOPS. And we did a three-year contract to develop about 15, 10 to 15 electronic products. So this is an earbud made of cornstarch, which actually is better than an oil-based plastic for the sound quality. The sound is quite brittle. And this, the shape of it is also funneling the sound out, so the sound quality is higher, and the actual material quality. So you actually have a, really, a real product. And when we put this on the market and told all of the young guys it was completely uh, recycled, recyclable material, the sales just went through the roof. So it's amazing that now the younger generation of, uh, of, of people respond to this. Um, can we go to the next one? Um, so. If you put all of those things into the equation, then add what I'm going to talk about now is how I've managed to get a spirit of things moving forward in China. A lot of uh, uh, traditional craft companies in Asia are starting to lose all of their sales because this younger generation of uh, consumer prefers to watch uh, David Beckham than Buddha or, you know, ping pong uh, than drink a cup of uh, traditional tea. So what we were asked to do is, to, you know, for me to design a real product, there has to be a reality into the, into the essence of the product. So I've always been interested in, in, in these arithmetic, mathematical structures, which is just a parabolic uh, form. And then combining all of these wonderful historical uh, roof architectures, which are actually uh, so in, in many ways, China invented some of this beautiful mathematic parabolic, parabolic cons construction. So what we did was bring these together. So I'm just going to show you how we, w we explained to this Asian company who uh, the CEO was 65 years old, how we put the spirit back into his company. Um, can we go to the next one? So we started off um, building this 
into a 3D form. So we actually had a, an object that we could play with and then um, start to dissect it and understand how we work with a real parabolic structure. Um, so we started, uh, you know, I'm not an artist. I like economy and uh, I like function. So I'm, it's very clear to me that I need to be very direct in the way I do things. So this is uh, um, a structures we started to create. And eventually we go to the next one. Eventually we started to build these objects out of the three dimensionality of that. Um, we did so much work for this brand, just studying everything. But eventually, out of hundreds of uh, different objects, we arrived at these seven, seven or eight objects um, and came up with these glass structures, which uh, are the only way we could place we could really make these was in China, because they had the skills of carving all of the, uh, you know, the dragons and what have you. And this, this is all hand carved by eye, absolutely 100% perfect cast in the ground, left there for three months, and then brought out. So we'll go on to the collection. And again, um, I sort of lost 15 minutes in that delay, so uh, seven minutes. OK, so keep going. Um, and then so this collection, it just happened that at the same time as doing that glass collection, DuPont Corian gave me a really high budget to do their new concept store in China. Um, so basically, it just so happened that their sample was a hexagon as well. And I actually don't like hexagons. It's not something I feel warm about. It's, for me, it's just a, it's a, a vehicle of, to express things with. So if we, uh, I, d I then put all of these things in. So for example, this wall, um, this wall came as a result of understanding how to build these parabolic structures because this is gigantic. There's about 10,000 different shaped objects in that which we glued together on site. Basically their, their request to me was to do anything I wanted to inspire architects, which was quite good because um, I think it's nice to have the upper hand on an architect from time to time. And I was actually going to start advertising free architectural services on DZine because I've seen a few uh, architects designing free furniture recently, which is not very good for my business. Um, so I might do that one day. So we'll go to the next one. Um, so you can see all of these things come through. And this was really just to make an experience through um, keep on if we keep on going. So what I sort of discovered was that um, um, all of these years in Asia began to inspire the three-dimensionality of my work and come together in one place. Um, and if we keep on going, even clearly, when somebody says to you know to designer, you can do anything you want, you know why not? Clearly, this is a bit of fun. Um, it doesn't work, obviously. It's a full-size Korean motorbike. They made it in three days in the factory. The level of enthusiasm to get this done was absolutely immense. And you know, the guys went crazy for it because it's opening up a whole new universe for them. So if we keep on going, um, keep on going. I'll keep on going. I'm going to miss this project out because there's not a lot of time. I just want to get to stop here. Um, if we go back. So I'm just going to finish on this sort of thing, which was, so I do a lot of the industrial design and all of the, all of the spare work I have, whenever I go to these factories, I always say to them, can you do this, can you do that? And they never say no. They always say, um, we'd like to try and do that for you. Um, and I'll say, okay, can I have 10? Um, and they always say, okay. And as long as the boss of the company gets one for his sitting room. So this is really nice way of, training each other. I get to, l to learn how to work with their factory. They get to train uh, their staff and workers on how to work with new forms, in a, possibly in a, a different environment than they used to. So if we keep on going, um, again, all of these chairs which we grew out of this project. I'm kind of over this sort of period of my life now, but um, it's still fairly relevant. It's still happening. We're taking this exhibition around the world, and in December it goes to, uh, it goes to Melbourne, and then it's going to go to San Francisco. Um, and then, you know, all of these things help these Asian companies have a presence in a new environment. So, you know, I sent this exhibition to Miami to design Miami. So this, for the first time, they really experienced what design was. And, uh, structures which uh, again I said I want to make this and they said okay and now we just build these things for special occasions um, who knows why just fun and um, if we go 
to this. You can see the, the influence of the electronics industry coming through into the detailing of these products. And uh, keep on going, uh, keep on going. I'm just going to sort of go through. Um, I want to show you one last slide, which is quite funny. Um, and yeah, I won't talk about this one. This was a joke building I made, which uh, um, I won't, I'll talk about it another next year. This was funny. I just wanted because I also I went around China looking at all of the um, uh, the different ways we could make things, and a lot of the, a lot of marble around the world is made on the coast. And it was just at the time, for some very strange reason, I got commissioned to, to design a tombstone in Melbourne for a friend's mother who'd passed away. Um, it was a, a, a Jewish family, and uh, they actually asked me to design this thing. And it's actually got designed by Michael Young in gold writing on the back. And I didn't want to put my name on it, but they wanted to put it on there. So if you go to the, the local graveyard then, and I found it quite hilarious. So when I was at the Tomb Makers, I decided to uh, make my own grave there. And uh, when I had the exhibition, this is really hard to ship about this. It's so heavy. It's the weight of a car. Um, it's actually, you know, it's really big. And what I did was, this is the original Macintosh font, uh, which I thought was quite nice to the, the contrast. And I put your name here just as a joke, because I put it in a shop window on Hollywood Road um, just to, for a bit of fun. But what actually happened, I opened the exhibition, and all of the local businessmen just put their business cards into the into the object. So at the end, I had this huge pile of business cards of all of the CEOs from around uh, local Hong Kong who were interested in the exhibition. So it was a, a very nice, ironic piece of luck. And um, I think there might be one more slide. This is just the last thing I wanted to talk about because this is a dream come true for me. I've just actually been in China last week because I, I've got a mini moke. I've got some cars but they're all stupidly in the wrong countries i don't live in there i've got one in an airport in in sydney another one in amsterdam still there which i'm trying to get but minimoke i rebuilt one uh two years ago myself and i got to know the guys who just bought the intellectual property right so we've just started working on the new minimoke which is one of my favorite cars so these are going to be the new the seats were never finished properly there it was always taking parts off other parts of cars and thankfully 20 years later, those parts aren't available, so we're, we're resurrecting the car. And uh, so just watch this space, because if you know what a Mini Moke is, it's this car that is going to go to Monaco, but it's also going to go to third world countries, the same model, appreciated the same car as a, a luxury vehicle and a functional vehicle. So I think that's really it, because I've ran out of time. I don't know whether there's any more. Is that the last slide? So I think I just, um, that was a little bit disjointed. I normally try to get a more sort of fluid message going through that, but um, I sort of got kicked in the middle. Um, so I'll just say thanks for sitting through that and uh, um, thank you, cheers.